In this video, we'll talk about the different kinds of cache misses, and we'll also talk about what can go wrong in particular pathological cases. A cache miss occurs when the CPU wants a piece of data, and that data is not in the cache. And what are the reasons for the miss? Well, there are really three different kinds of cache misses, compulsory, capacity, and conflict misses. So the first kind, the compulsory miss, occurs when the program first begins. Obviously, when a program first begins, its data, its working set data, is not going to be in the cache. So the first time the data is accessed, there will be a cache miss. And you have to load the uh, cache, and so that's why we call it a compulsory miss. Sometimes we talk about the cache being cold. The idea there is that when the program first begins, there's nothing in the cache. The working set is not yet in the cache at all. So the cache is cold. And in the first uh, part of the program, as the program uh, gets going, it will load its working set into cache. And after that, we say the cache is warmed up. For some uh, computers, the cache might be just too small to contain the entire working set. And if the cache is too small, then we can't get the entire ca working set into the cache. And so we're going to have misses as a result of that. And those are called capacity misses. The idea is that if you could make the cache a little bit larger, those misses would not be happening. And finally, we have a conflict miss. Here, the idea is you've got plenty of room in the cache, but there are two blocks in the working set that happen to map into the same part of the cache so that they cannot both be in the cache at the same time. So even though there's plenty of room in other parts of the cache because of the way the cache mapping occurs, there's a conflict miss. We saw how this could occur with a direct mapped cache, and the solution is essentially to have uh, a set associative cache. And so with an eight-way set associative cache, um, you have each place in the cache uh, containing a, an associative memory, so you can put eight different things in there. So the conflict misses go way down with modern cache design. So if we do have misses, then things can go bad. Uh, and one thing that can go bad is, look at this situation here. Imagine that uh, both blocks X and Y are in the working set, and somehow they map to the same place, or for some, uh, uh, for some reason, uh, when we load X, we end up evicting Y. And then, because they're both in the working set, pretty soon we need Y. And when we load Y, we evict X. And then pretty soon again, we need X uh, once more. And so we load X, evicting Y. And this process goes on and on. So we've got a very serious situation, and that situation is called thrashing. Suddenly, every access is a cache miss, and performance is going to fall dramatically. Cache thrashing is very bad. We might as well not even have a cache. So if this occurs, we've got a very bad performance problem. Let's take a look at uh, a program, which might be uh, typical of what you might see. Um, these lines up here indicate instructions uh, and code. And the idea is that you've got a loop. So these instructions here are executed repeatedly over and over. And maybe in the middle of the loop, uh, we call a subroutine. And that's indicated by this code over here. So we, we jump over here for a moment. And then we return to the loop, keep going. And maybe we call another subroutine. So in this particular example, uh, this loop uh, does a bunch of stuff. And that includes calling these two subroutines. We might have more subroutines. Maybe this one calls uh, yet another one. Or perhaps this one calls this one as well. But uh, in this particular example, uh, I think we've got a pretty tight loop, and we've reduced uh, procedure calls from the loop body as much as we can. And there still are two procedures called, which is uh, probably something to think about if you're worried about performance. But let's say this is a, a typical unoptimized program. And uh, what does this program do? It, it accesses some data. So it may have some static data variables, uh, accumulators, sums, and so on. So uh, those variables are indicated with these lines here. So here's some, some data, some variables that get accessed. This loop um, may be going through uh, some arrays. 
After all, if we're worried about performance, we're executing this loop a whole bunch of times, and that means we're probably doing it on uh, arrays. So maybe we're accessing uh, some array A and some other array B. Um, we may be coming back to X, Y, and Z over and over and over again, whereas with these arrays, we're kind of sort of stepping through them sequentially or uh, jumping around. If we have a stride one program, if our program is exhibiting stride one behavior, then it's going through memory sequentially for the array. And we would hope that it's uh, behaving with stride one access patterns for both these arrays. Okay, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six hotspots. And those hotspots are somewhere in memory. And here I'm just um, suggesting that uh, one hotspot's here, there, there, and we've got six hotspots uh, in memory. The instructions in those hotspots are going to get mapped into cache, into blocks. So the red circles here indicate a block of data. In our example, uh, using the size of the caches for the Intel chips, the block size was 64 bytes. So these red circles are circling 64 bytes at a time. And you see a couple of different things going on. Uh, in the case of variables X, Y, Z, maybe the entire hotspot fits into one block. Um, let's see if these are lined up. Uh, maybe it's this, uh, this subroutine that's fitting into one block. Um, on the other hand, uh, the hotspot might happen to be on a block boundary. So even though maybe you have only just a few bytes for X, Y, and Z, they may have, by unfortunate chance, been positioned so that a block boundary is crossed. With the arrays A and B, we're probably going through them sequentially. So uh, here I'm showing um, that at one moment in time, we're sort of working on these elements of, of one array. Um, and here, uh, I'm showing that the array may be very big, but uh, at one instance of time, we're going through these elements. And later on, uh, the working chef the working set will shift and the next block will be needed. Now how many blocks are we looking at here? Um, well, in the worst case, all of these blocks might map to the very same set. Okay, uh, But notice when we have two adjacent blocks that they will not map to the same set. So they will map to different sets. This one will map to perhaps set two, and this one to set three. Um, so here we have six hotspots. Okay, so we might be mapping this one to the same set as we're mapping this block, and maybe this block happens to go into that set, and this one, and this one, and this one as well. Well, the adjacent blocks, this block and perhaps the block above it, um, will go into different sets. So with an eight-way set associative cache, it's not a problem. We can get this block, this block, this block, this block, and this block, and this block. That's only six blocks into the set and still have uh, two uh, lines still available. So what is our worst case scenario? Well, maybe the working set is really, really large. Um, in the previous example, I showed a working set that had uh, six hotspots, but Maybe we have uh, more hotspots, um, and maybe they all happen to map into the same set. Um, well, that, that would be a problem, because each set has um, only eight slots. But we have 64 sets total, so for the chance of all 10 of these mapping into the same set is, is pretty, pretty low. So um, this is not really that much of a concern. Some hotspots may require uh, several blocks, like uh, we may have a, a particularly large loop, and I've shown this over here. So this hotspot requires uh, lots and lots of blocks. Um, but notice that the adjacent blocks go into different sets. So this block here might go into set number seven. Well, that means this one goes into set number eight, this one goes into set number nine, and six and five for these two blocks. So uh, they're going into different sets, so we should have no problem there. 
some hot spots, some hot spots could be very large. Um, the block size is 64 bytes, and we've got a total of uh, 64 different sets. So the hot spot would have to be greater than four kilobytes in order for some set uh, to contain more than one block from that same hotspot. In other words, it's got to be really pretty big. There's uh, four kilobytes between this block and this block, uh, and if the hotspot is really that big, then you know eventually we'll have to put another block from the same hotspot into that set. But that's a very unusual hotspot. It's so big that you know we're, we're sort of stretching our notion of the working set to start with. But if that did occur, uh, well, it's still not really much of a problem because keep in mind each set can contain up to eight lines, so uh, we can get both these two blocks into uh, the cache at the same time. There's another kind of problem we might want to consider. We have made the assumption up until now that the principle of locality applies to our programs. But what about programs that don't have locality? Uh, they jump all over the place. Uh, sometimes uh, this is called spaghetti code and here I've tried to show you that this program has really chaotic behavior. It's jumping all over memory and you can see why they call programs that are coded in this way spaghetti code. What's going to create a program that has this behavior, this lack of locality behavior? Well, it's kind of hard to imagine, but you know, maybe some sort of a neural net simulation where you're jumping all over memory to follow the neural connections. Um, it's hard to really imagine programmers doing this. Uh, you know, programmers write pretty organized code. Uh, you know, maybe a few beginning students uh, use uh, go-tos more than they ought to, but even though they do use go-tos instead of structured programming concepts, their, the resulting programs still exhibit the uh, locality that we're talking about. It's, it's kind of hard for program, programmers, human programmers, to create code that's you know, really chaotic. It just is not, not something that happens. But maybe uh, there is some code that's being generated automatically by some software. It, I suppose it's conceivable that it could be generating code that uh, does not have locality. Um, there may be some algorithms, some uh, very unusual algorithms that uh, really jump around a lot and these may not exhibit uh, the, the locality that um, makes caching work so well. Uh, you know, in particular, if you have graph-like data structures, um, then uh, they may jump around. They may have all kinds of links uh, that go from one point in memory to the next point in memory. Here I've shown um, object-oriented programming. These little rectangles here represent objects and each object contains references or pointers to other objects. And the programmer may see some organization to these things, but where they go in memory is really an artifact of uh, what memory happened to look like, uh, what was free when the objects were created. So usually there are patterns to the way programs work and these things end up more or less going close to each other in memory. Um, but maybe not. Um, maybe they're added willy-nilly uh, bit by bit. You're building up this graph in, in, in odd ways. And so these objects are located far apart. Well, any algorithm that works on a data structure that looks like this is going to jump around a bit. Also, with garbage collection, and uh, object-oriented programming, the objects don't necessarily have to be near each other. And so it may be that the um, objects get moved around during garbage collection uh, and there's no particular need to keep them close to each other. Uh, so they may uh, drift around in memory over, over time and end up being located uh, in more or less random places. But nevertheless, um, most programs do ex exhibit locality of reference and so this principle of locality means that programs do have working sets and so the whole concept of cache works. Uh, we can 
most always get the working set into cache and so the program runs faster.